Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to test this filter, which is the uh, Antlia ALPT high speed dual narrowband filter. And uh, the astute among you might have noticed that I already reviewed this filter like one year ago, perhaps even earlier than that, I don't quite remember. But at the time, I reviewed the standard version of this filter. It, uh, in fact, only the standard version of the filter existed at that time. And uh, now they have a high-speed version. Before I go into the details, I want to give a brief overview of, about what the filter is all about. This is a dual-band, narrow-band filter, which means it is meant for color cameras, one-shot color cameras like this one. This is a Ryzen Cam one-shot color camera with a Sony 571 uh, sensor uh, that is APS-C sized. And when you're imaging uh, from Tokyo or from very light polluted cities like here in Tokyo, you want to block out as much of the light pollution as possible while gathering the most signal that you can from your target. It so happens that emission nebulae like the Great Orion Nebula, the California Nebula, uh, the Rosette Nebula, etc., etc., they emit in very, very specific colors. Uh, one of those colors is around a wavelength of 500 nanometers, which is oxygen-3. Another is around 656.3 nanometer for H-alpha. Um, so yeah, those two band passes are the ones that typically have the most signal available to capture. And, uh, and so if we just restrict the data that we capture on those nebula to those very thin slices of color, we will basically reject all of the light pollution from any other uh, colors that because we're just blocking all of that. So it's awesome, it's amazing, and it's exactly what we want. So uh, this filter lets us do that. It will capture those two colors, one for oxygen-3, one for H-alpha, which means it should be excellent for nebulae. Uh, current viewers of my channels know that I currently use the Optolong L-Extreme for that purpose and that my particular sample of the Optolong L-Extreme is similar to that uh, and it works very well with uh, my high-speed telescope and that's because I have a great sample of the L-Extreme. Most L-Extremes will not work well at uh, F2. So why, if I have the L-Extreme, did I go ahead and buy this? Because yes, I, I bought it. I did get a small discount from um, Antlia, but I did buy it. And it's because the band passes of this filter are narrower than the L-Extreme band passes. The L-Extreme band passes are seven nanometers, and this one are five nanometers wide. And so that means it rejects, it keeps the same amount of signal coming in, and it rejects more of the light pollution, which is good. And I did a recent imaging challenge where <laughs> a lot of the complaints of, uh, of the viewers who um, processed my image, and thank you so much, by the way, but was that the gradients, the light pollution gradients were super hard to get rid of. Of welcome to my world. <laughs> Hopefully, with tighter band passes, we should be able to uh, reject more of those light, this light pollution, and f maybe have fewer gradients. Which we, sh we shall see. And going back to why do I need this high-speed version of the filter uh, versus just like being happy with uh, with the old version, the standard version of the filter, is because I have a high-speed telescope. So by high speed, I mean that effectively the light rays that uh, that enter the telescope from the edge of the objective lens will will have a very steep angle when they hit the filter, something like that. And towards the center, there's a central central obstruction, so there are no light rays that will arrive at just 90 degrees perfectly. So even the the light rays that hit towards the center center towards the central obstruction, they still have a fairly steep angle, which means that every light ray that will reach this filter will arrive at a steep angle. And so it will shift out the bandpass. If the bandpass shifts out too much, which is, which would be the case with very narrow filters like this one at um, high speeds, unless they're pre-shifted. So if they shift too much, we end up with a bandpass that lets in light pollution, but doesn't let in signal. That, that is not good. And so that's why the high speed version exists. Now, before I test this telescope under the stars, uh, hopefully tonight, it's supposed to be clear, 
Uh, uh, fingers crossed, we'll see. But before I do this test, I want to make sure that the filter is actually performing as per specifications. And also I want to show you what the default specifications are for the filter. Fortunately, I have a spectrophotometer to help me determine exactly what the bandpass of my filter is. So let's go inside and check out the results. But before we do this, I want to let you guys know that the reason I was able to buy this uh, spectrometer was in part thanks to the generous contribution of my Patreon supporters. My Patreon supporters, by the way, they get access to my videos in advance and ad-free and also some exclusive unedited and uncut processing videos. If you want to support my channel, support my astrophotography endeavors, uh, you may want to look down in the description to that Patreon link. And thank you so much in advance. Anyway, let's really go inside this time. And here we are. Uh, these are the theoretical curves of, uh, of the filter. So we can see, as expected, uh, the curves are um, shifted to the right so that when we use this with a, a high-speed system with high incidence angles, this curve will be shifted to the left. The steeper the angle, the more it is shifted. And same for this curve here. And we can say, see that even at low speed, there is quite a bit of transmission uh, for oxygen 3 and, uh, and H alpha because the uh, bandpass is still 5 nanometers and not something more extreme like 3 nanometers. So it does leave some um, room for mistakes to happen with the filter or for some imprecision with the filter manufacturing. That said, um, we can see the peak is supposed to be something like 60, uh, 658, roughly, nanometers for hydrogen alpha and 502 for oxygen 3. And I measured the filter with my spectrometer. And we can see pretty much exactly as, um, as predicted. You can also see like the peak transmission is lower for oxygen 3 than H alpha. Um, which is what I'm seeing here as well. Although I don't have like the percentage of, uh, of transmission uh, that I can compute properly due to some limitations of my spectrometer. But you can see the peak of oxygen-3 is at 502 nanometer compared to 502.2 uh, in the spec. And this, the peak here in H-alpha is, uh, where is it? It's there. It's at, uh, yeah, 658. So 658 nanometers, which is, again, exactly what we would be expecting for uh, for the filter based on the uh, specifications. So yeah, it looks to be um, a really good filter. I've also checked the bandpass, the full width half max. That seems to be between 5 and 5.5 nanometers. So definitely within the specs as well. So it looks like at least um, my sample of the filter is uh, turning out really well. Um, in terms of both the bandpasses and the placement of the bandpasses. And we can indeed confirm that if I look at like 500.5 uh, nanometers, which would be roughly where oxygen-3 is, we have quite a bit of, um, of transmission. This is it. And if we look at um, 657 roughly or 656, let's, let's look at uh, 650. 6.5, there it is. We have also a lot of transmission of NH alpha. So even though it is a high speed filter, it still means that if you have a high speed lens, uh, like an F2 Samyang lens, and uh, you use this filter with it, even the light rays that arrive at the center of your lens that don't have, that have a very small angle, um, they will not benefit from, from any bandpass shift, but the signal from oxygen three and H alpha is still passed like quite a lot. So I think this is like a really good kind of compromise for a filter, kind of a Goldilocks compromise where you have a high speed filter that should be working great at pretty much any focal ratio from what I can tell, because it really covers a wide range of angles um, that I can see. So uh, the next step will be to test this. Okay, and I did the tests on the high-speed version of the golden filter, the ALPT filter by Antlia. And I compared it with my current reference, the one, the filter that I'm using most of the time with my Hyperstar setup, which is the L-Extreme. And uh, the protocol was uh, that I took 55 minutes, so 11 5-minute frames, on the Tadpoles Nebula right before Meridian and right after Meridian for each of the filters so I could control exactly 
exactly the um, circumstances for each of the filters so we could have like a really um, easy to compare apples to apples uh, kind of uh, kind of setup. The problem is that uh, originally I thought it was the fault of the Antlia filter and actually made a video based on that uh, and now I had to have to scrap it and to do it again because I believe I forgot to turn off my balcony light while I was doing the test with the ALPT which led to some really weird kind of patterns on the ALPT uh, version and it also meant that the uh, contrast was not as good as the L-Extreme and so I thought that the ALPT was terrible and I wasn't going to be using using it because it had reflection problems or whatever, but I do believe it was completely my fault. So the following night, which was actually last night, during the full moon, I did the test again right after the Meridian on the tadpoles with the ALPT. So the uh, L-Extreme test was done right uh, after the Meridian, two nights ago when the moon was like 97% full. The ALPT was done last night, uh, near the uh, right after the meridian, when the moon was a bit closer and was like completely full. So in theory, the ALPT is at a disadvantage. And of course, uh, while I don't care too much about star halos, I know that a lot of people care a lot about star halos, so I also imaged the Horsehead Nebula. I didn't do an apples to apples kind of comparison this time in terms of signal to noise ratio, since I didn't want to test the signal to noise ratio, that's what the tadpole's for, but I would just want to look at the star halos. So I have an integration with the L-Extreme and an integration with the Antlia on very different nights, uh, but both on the uh, horse head, so we can look at the halos. The ALPD has a bit more integration time than the uh, L-Extreme, so I'll come back, to the, come back to that in a moment. And here we are with the results. On the left, you have the L-Extreme result. On the right, you have the ALPT result. And this is the ALPT without me leaving my balcony light on like an idiot. Uh, and once I do this test properly, I can tell that the ALPT is definitely better. Uh, one of the easiest ways to think to see this is to look at this top left corner, uh, which has like much less gradients uh, in the ALPT, and therefore the uh, the details of the nebulosity are much more visible. Even the arc here around the tadpoles is much more visible on the ALPT than it is on the L extreme on the left. So this is really really um, good to see. And it is as expected. Overall, I see there's still like a, a gradient here on the bottom left, which I assume is from the moonlight, possibly the light pollution. Uh, but while the um, L-Extreme has some more trouble with gradients from light pollution, even though I, I took the, the flat frames for both filters one after another using the exact same uh, protocol, the Antlia seems to be managing those gradients much better, which is a huge, huge plus in my book and in the book of everyone who has tried to process my Rosette data uh, from a month ago or so, <laughs> because the main complaint was about the gradients. So this is a big relief that the Antlia seems to be performing better, just so that we can see this uh, a bit better. I have created the H-alpha, so it's just a red channel, and the um, Oxygen-3, which is a blend of uh, blue and green, with blue at a weight of 0 0.7, green, no, blue as a rate as a, a weight of 0 0.3, and green has a rate, uh, a weight of 0 0.7. So if we look at the L, again, the L-Extreme is on the left, the LPT is on the right, and it is again clear that both in terms of contrast um, and in terms of control of the gradients, in terms of the details that were captured, like those lines here, the uh, ALPT is the clear winner, which is, you know, as expected. And I'm really, really, really happy to see that because I can, I can retire both my IDAS NBZ and my L-Extreme for high-speed imaging. Awesome. And on the bottom, we have Oxygen 3, and again, L-Extreme on the left and ALPT on the right. The uh, difference is not that marked uh, on this one, although like we can see tons of um, gradients here for the L-Extreme that don't really exist with the ALPT, just like we saw on the, uh, on the color image. So this is really, really nice. I mean, even like looking at the, at the noise in each of the pictures, it does feel like the LPT has, has less noise in general, like in those um, dark areas as well for H-alpha and, uh, and oxygen-3. 
So this is this is really good to um, to see. Now let's look at the Horsehead Nebula. And here we are with the Horsehead Nebula. We have the L Extreme on the left with less integration than the ALPT on the right, which has uh, more integration time. So in theory, you would expect to see the halos better for the ALPT. And if we look just at Alnitak, at the, at the halo around Alnitak, it does feel like the L Extreme uh, halo is more noticeable. The, um, the, the edge is clearer whereas it's fuzzier for the ALPT, despite the ALPT has having um, you know, more integration time. So it does feel like the ALPT has already won in terms of the signal to noise ratio as expected, even though it has wor it had slightly worse conditions with the uh, completely full moon. And now if you look at, uh, at the halos, the ALPT is winning again. And we can look at the uh, other halo here on the bottom left, sorry about the poor collimation, um, and we have, again, the same result. The halo does seem more defined, especially the edge of it, for the l extreme compared to the, uh, the Antlia. So this is win. Where things get a bit dodgy is some kind of weird reflections, which could be due to my collimation. But you can see for the l extreme, we do have like one weird kind of uh, reflection here. And for the Antlia, we have like a big donut here and then uh, another donut here, which seems to be reflections. So um, my Patreon supporters have suggested that this could be due to poor collimation um, for the Hyperstar, which is true. The collimation is not perfect, and I plan on working on this and uh, testing it again. But for now, I, I don't really like those, uh, those weird uh, reflections. And yeah, it does, it does seem to affect the Alextreme to some extent as well in exa almost exactly the same spot and maybe even here a little bit as well but it's much more visible for the Antlia so I, I don't know exactly what it, what is the cause for that but this is really really like saved for me by the uh, the signal to noise ratio that's clearly superior for the ALPT which is great and which is a big relief for me because the first time I tested it and I thought I the ALPT was terrible but this was because again I believe I had forgotten uh, bal balcony light um, but yeah this is this is really the extent of it uh, for now so the ALPT does seem to have a really good signal to noise ratio on my hyperstar setup it would be great for hyperstar and raza setups is that it does have halos on very bright stars but they seem to be uh, better controlled than my l extreme but there are some weird donut reflections that i saw on the horse head that might be due to uh, my collimation. Uh, one of my Patreons has told me that he has the same filter and on Raza he does not see such reflections. So it could be either collimation or my own filter being uh, uh, having like reflections or kind of like sample bias. We'll see, I'll do some more tests, but overall at this stage I can definitely recommend the LPT for narrowband imaging on high-speed um, systems like Hyperstar or Raza. It really seems to be working well with the, uh, the KVATs that I mentioned. Okay, with that, I hope this was interesting to you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, whenever you can, to look up at the stars, and I'll see you next time.